the problem with CLL is that it causes a progressive drop in people's immunity. And that has severe consequences, serious consequences in terms of risk of infection. Many people end up with structural lung disease simply because they have recurrent chest infections. So as time goes by, there's a reduction in the level of immunoglobulins as well as difficulties in the, in the cellular immune system. So T cells uh, end up with problems as well. So it's not just antibody levels that are reduced, it's the cellular form of the immune system that's affected as well. So there's a double whammy. And as time goes by and the disease gets worse, then those problems get worse as well. And we're talking about a patient group that's already potentially elderly and have comorbidities. So they may have kidney problems, they may have diabetes, heart disease, things that are going to increase the risk of infection already. So this is a group where the rising tide of comorbidities and disease leads to an increased risk of infection. As soon as you throw in treatment into the mix as well, that can lead to another stepwise reduction in, in the immunity. So you can lead to an increase in the, the, the risk of hypogamma globulinemia, and it can lower T cell counts, particularly the CD4 count. So the idea with, with CLL is to try and prevent these risks from happening in the first place. One of the strategies is to vaccinate. So if we look at the, the guidance, the CLL, the BSH CLL guidance, clearly states that we must use vaccination, particularly against the pneumococcus. So pneumococcal pneumonia is a, a severe infection, often one of the community acquired infections that can cause severe illness in our CLL populations. To abrogate this, using the, uh, the PCV13 or Prevnar 13 vaccine, one of the conjugated vaccines early on in the course of the, the condition, as soon as the CLL is diagnosed, is very, very sensible. Checking the response to that, looking at the pneumonia-specific immunoglobulins, some four to six weeks later, allows you to assess whether there's been a successful immunological response to this. Now that's important because you need that later on. As time goes by when the immune system's lower, you may wish to access immunoglobulin replacement treatment. So we're talking early on now, so you've got your pneumonia vaccines, the pneumococcal vaccine, you have the first one, and then in the guidelines it suggests having the PPV23 vaccine some two to six months later. And then again, rechecking the levels and see whether there's a response to it. So that's one of the important building blocks of immunity and CLL. If somebody is going on and experiencing infections, then starting a prophylactic antibiotic is very reasonable. And if they have breakthrough infections despite that, particularly if you've shown that there's been no response to the pneumonia vaccine, then you can start negotiating with the trust committee about immunoglobulin replacement. And if you haven't got those building blocks in place, you haven't done your at least a three month trial of antibiotics, you haven't assessed the response to the pneumonia vaccine, then you can't move forward. So that's why getting those things done early on is important. And in CLL, unfortunately, many people who have the vaccine, even if it's early in the course of the disease, they still may not respond properly to the vaccine. And you do need to identify that. You need to document it so that you can move forward and access immunoglobulin replacement at a later stage, potentially. Now, as soon as it comes to the drop in the T cells, then you need to start thinking about prophylaxis, particularly against herpes zoster virus with the cyclovir and pneumonia, uh, P PJP, pneumonia urevecchi, with cotrimoxazole. And those are two key antibiotics that will help prevent that while the CD4 count is less than 200. Now, some treatments are worse than others. So if we're talking about fludarabine cyclophosphamide rituximab, bendamustine rituximab, these drug combinations will cause a very low CD4 count for a prolonged period of time. And so prophylaxis really should continue until at least the CD4 count picks up above 200. And that may take a long time. It may take two or three years for that to happen. So monitoring that becomes important as well. One of the commonest used drugs these days, uh, particularly in second line treatment, once people have had uh, first line therapy, is, is ibrutinib. And ibrutinib also leads to some effect on T cells. 
It's not fully understood, but it binds to aspects of the T cell that, that change the, and skew the T cell immune function. And that also may increase risk of infections. And we know there's been a, a signal in some of the uh, papers published looking at uh, pneumonia, particularly PJP, and some fungal infections. So we're still looking at this and still identifying how best to, to manage this. But the, uh, the general advice with ibrutinib, again, is to use cotramoxazole as a, a, a PCP prophylactic drug.